back on the zero hour. Some elections just took place. You may have heard something about it. And here to talk to us about that and so much more now is our good friend John Nichols. John is, of course, the Washington correspondent for the nation, and he covers all this stuff. So without any further ado, John Nichols, welcome back to the program. Richard, it is a pleasure to be with you. I, I wish we were together in person, uh, but we're together through the wonders of uh, technology. Uh, yes, we are, and uh, I welcome it. Now, uh, let's start with uh, the freshest news as we speak, which is Tuesday's election. Um, overall snapshot, uh, before we zero in on a couple of races, what did you think? I mean, to me, the big items that jumped out at me were uh were kentucky uh maybe mississippi uh, virginia but uh it did a theme uh you know a lot of people have been drawing themes and trends from this did anything jump out at you as a broader theme oh yeah without a doubt um it look it was the best night for democrats uh in an off-year election in a very long time it was a historically good night for Democrats. And that was significant because it came after the weekend uh, polling released by the New York Times. Right. A series of polls from battleground states uh, in which Joe Biden was trailing Donald Trump in five of six key states. And so, you know, on Sunday and Monday into Tuesday, you had Democrats kind of pulling their hair out saying, wow, you know, this this whole thing looks to be falling apart. The wheels are coming off the bus. And then Tuesday night, you get this this incredible uh, overlay of results, this intervention, if you will, which suggests that that actually Democrats are doing incredibly well. They took the governorship of Kentucky. They almost took the governorship of Mississippi, which is amazing. Um, They took the control of state legislature in Virginia. They increased their control in uh, New Jersey, which was very, very significant. Republicans actually thought they were going to, you know, kind of dial that back a bit and and improve their position. Uh, They had tremendous victories in school board races around the country in Pennsylvania, New York State, other places where they really pushed back against this Republican agenda of you know, not teaching history, picking on LGBTQI students, et cetera. Um, and then you had a whole new generation of young, uh, progressive Democratic electeds coming up. Sarah Inamorato in the um, uh, Allegheny County, Pittsburgh area. That's a big deal. That uh, Allegheny County is 1.3 million people. It's, it's bigger than most states. And the county executive there is essentially a governor, right? It's a very, very powerful mm-hmm person. And then in, in, uh, I I was fascinated by a race out in the Minneapolis area, St. Louis Park, which elected a 27 year old Muslim woman, um, first Muslim mayor, first black mayor, first Somali American mayor at a time when we're seeing so much Islamophobia. Um, St. Louis Park's a a very large suburb, 50,000 people, historically a, a more conservative place, evidence that, um, that I think a lot of the assumptions that pundits make in Washington about mm. where America's headed and what is possible uh, were proven wrong on, on Tuesday. That doesn't mean Biden's on a clean trajectory to get reelected or anything like that. He's still got plenty of challenges that we can talk about. But what it does mean is that, that it, it's wise to keep polling in perspective. Right. And, If I'm given a choice between reading a poll or looking at actual election results, on balance, I'm going to look at actual election results and and take from them the suggestion that, you know, frankly, Democrats are not in particularly bad place. Uh, The Biden agenda looks to be quite popular across the country. Biden himself clearly has challenges. There's no question of that. Um, But. Uh, I think after Tuesday, you can see sort of a trajectory for him that you might not have seen on Sunday or Monday. Well, let's work our way up to Biden from uh, local elections on up. Let's start with school boards, because that to me is fascinating, John. And the reason why it's fascinating is because, you know, perhaps the only thing less reliable than polling in politics is uh 
conventional wisdom. And the conventional wisdom really coming out, I think, of Glenn Youngkin's victory uh, over Terry McAuliffe in Virginia was that school board level issues were going going to swing the electorate very heavily towards the Republican Party, that parents felt unheard, unlistened to, on cultural, so-called cultural issues and so on, and that uh, Youngkin's victory, as well as, you know, Loudoun County, which I would argue is an exceptional case in many ways, but it wasn't taken as an exceptional case, that that uh, Loudoun County, Virginia, and other places, uh, uh, there was a rebellion against woke and that this was going to drive uh, politics from the ground up in a certain direction. This was really, to me, at least the circles I am forced to listen to, this was uh, accepted wisdom. And yet what we're seeing now is, and a lot of people were tearing their hair out, don't don't uh, Democrats understand all politics is local and so on. And yet you're you're saying based on this uh or this, these results are saying uh not so fast and Absolutely. Yeah. and 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 what thought uh, what thoughts do you have about why that might be did democrats just mobilize better than they have been are people just uh repelled by the uh cultural policing of the right or is something else going on that that i don't i haven't sussed out personally well, you saw that a lot, so I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that that you've got a good perspective on some of this. But um, look, let's begin with the uh, premise that the whole quote, quote unquote parents' rights thing was a manufactured piece of BS. Um, it wasn't real. Uh, it, they had some intense school board meetings where people showed up at the local level and really were perhaps legitimately, perhaps illegitimately upset about a particular issue. Um, Fox News and uh, some people on the Republican right amplified this like crazy. You know as well as I do, Richard, that if we looked across the whole of the United States where you've got like 100,000 school boards, right? You know, just school board members all over and, and, and this whole thing. You start to look at all of these contests, all of these situations. Are you going to find, you know, patterns of, of people that are upset about any particular thing? You sure. are. Biggest thing they'll be upset about is whether the high school football team's winning. But the the reality is that that there was a, a major effort to amplify, um, you know, contention over over some of these issues. It was an effort on their part to make critical race theory an issue, to make um, to you know, attack trans kids, to do all sorts of things on on again what I guess you would refer to as woke. I wrote a big piece for the nation about a year or so ago, uh, two years ago, on all of this. And even at the time when it was at its most intense, when they were talking about Virginia like crazy, there were examples of school board races, contests around the country, where it was going the opposite way, where even then parents were mobilizing and beating the right wingers on behalf of teaching honest history, um, making sure that LGBTQI kids are protected, uh, making sure that schools are funded, that teachers get good contracts, et cetera, et cetera. That was always there. And I remember uh, at, at the time talking to Randy Weingarten, who's the head of AFT, about this. And, and she said, yeah, I mean, we're definitely concerned, but there's a lot of examples that, that it's not going the direction that, that the media tends to be suggesting. So um, what's happened, though, is that, yes, as you suggest, there's been more mobilization now. People did get scared. And so they said, oh, wow, OK, we, I guess we got to keep an eye on this. What happened, if you look at election results from Tuesday night and a lot of school boards were up for grabs all over in the suburban Pittsburgh area, where there are a lot of elections in suburban New York City, a lot of school board elections and and in suburban northern Virginia, you will see that progressives won all sorts of big victories in school board contests, often flipping control of school boards, uh, many, many successes, even in some of the places you've mentioned. And that comes on top of what we saw in the spring. In, in the spring, we had school board elections in the upper Midwest, in Wisconsin, uh, in uh, Illinois. And those elections saw sweeping victories for progressive candidates. And so I'm not telling you this issue is gone away altogether. I mean, I think there's still going to be contention. There always is. But what I can tell you is 
um, it's quite evident that uh, if you look across the country, parents do not want on balance to go toward the hard right at the school board level. And Democrats need to wake up to that. They need to realize that they make a big mistake if they embrace this, you know, this kind of agenda, if they get scared by it and go soft or cautious on it. And I'll remind you that on Tuesday, yes, Glenn Youngkin lost on on a number of issues, including abortion rights, which was very front and center in, in Virginia. But Glenn Youngkin is a poster boy for all this. And he was the biggest loser on Tuesday. So put that in the mix. And I think go forward with a lot more confidence that, um, you know, on balance in school board races across this country, progressives can win and, and often do. You know, it's so hard to track uh, school board races nationally because so much of the uh, campaigning is done face to face and handouts at the local level in front of the high school or whatever. But, you know, so do you do you have any sense of whether there were galvanizing issues or whether it was just, uh, you know, a common sense kind of pro teacher, pro schooling approach? Uh, because, uh, you know, if you have one candidate who's running on outrage, outrage is an attention getting issue right and whatever the outrage is about but if you have somebody saying no we need to you know fund our skill schools adequately we need to take care of our teachers we need to uh be concerned about class size you know whatever the issues are i'm just wondering if there were if there's any pattern to be discerned about specific issues other than the fact that the uh extremism is being rejected i, I think there are patterns and and i think here's here's one of the subtleties of it richard the um, when you saw the rise of a lot of this contention around school boards, it was in the immediate aftermath of the COVID crisis, and many schools were shut for a time. Many schools became sort of contentious as regards should they be open, should they not, stuff like that. A lot of kids, a lot of students went through a pretty tough time during COVID, and and I think parents uh, were playing that out. They were saying, you know, wow, I'm 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 unhappy. I, I I don't like what my kid's been through, right? Maybe they didn't like that the school was closed. Maybe they thought it was great that the school was closed, but they didn't like how the online learning went, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of contention around schools. I think that was an unfocused contention in many cases. The right sought to focus it on a set of issues, on banning CRT, on, you know, like banning uh, education about LGBTQI issues. On, on a host of other things. And often, interestingly enough, on cutting pay for teachers, right? On, on right. you know, the this sort of, frankly, anti-public ed- education agenda. And and some time has passed. We're a little bit further from the, the height of the COVID crisis. Um, I think that has, has shifted some of the thinking. I think the other thing that's happened is that teachers at the local level, who've been really under a lot of stress, right? I think that they recognized that there's going to be a necessity to step up and to be more active in these in these local races and make sure that they ended up with school boards that would be supportive of public education. And so I have seen a lot of evidence around the country of teacher unions stepping up and, and becoming more engaged in, in these local races, trying to make sure that, that the people that win elections are actually supportive of public education. That's really interesting. And to me, what it brings to mind is the teacher strikes of late in the last decade, where you saw supposedly, you know, so-called red states like West Virginia and, yeah. and, and Oklahoma and Arizona turning out in force to support their teachers. I mean, teachers are within these communities. They're well-respected, well-liked, well-known in these communities. So it's, it's encouraging to think of teachers as a political force moving up the um you know, the, up the pyramid of, of elected office. Not that I don't respect uh, people in uh, in school boards. I very much do. But uh, so we have the uh, legislative elections in West, in, excuse me, in Virginia. We have the first trans state senator, uh, uh, assembly person, uh, Dana Carome, moving up to be state senate. We have in what was considered to be a tough race. We have uh, Democrats taking back control of the legislature in what was considered a purple state turning more red uh, with the election of Youngkin. What do you make of that? 
Well, I think there's a lot going on in legislatures around the country. And let's let's step back one step, Richard, and uh, and recognize that there's a legislative election pretty much every every week in America someplace in a special election for an open seat or even a, a number of them. And um, because there's a lot of legislative seats, there's you know, thousands of them across this country. And in this year of 2023, we have seen a clear pattern of Democrats winning special elections for legislative seats, flipping a lot of seats. One of the most incredible things that's been going on is up in New Hampshire, where you know they started the year with Republicans pretty solidly in control of the state house. With each special election, it's gotten closer and closer and closer, so that now um, Democrats are on the cusp of taking control of the state house in New Hampshire, not in a general election in 2024, but they might even do it before in a special election because they've had so many, said so much progress there. And and now this pattern kind of came to a head in Tuesday's elections because you had large numbers of seats up for grabs in uh, New Jersey, Virginia, and by the way, I mentioned Mississippi. And um, there's a lot of victories there for progressive candidates. Overall, the thing to, is about control of, of legislative chambers. And what we saw on Tuesday was a very significant thing in the state of Virginia, where Glenn Youngkin came in in 2021 with a you know legislature that was split. He now has a legislature that is united on the Democratic side. And it's even more than that, Richard, because in some of the primaries this year, um, progressive Democrats beat more conservative Democrats. So this legislature that will come into being after this election is going to be the most progressive legislator, legislature that Virginia has had in a while. And that's going to push back hard on Yonkin on not just abortion rights, where Yonkin's agenda is now crashed and burned, but but also on some of these education issues we've just been talking about. This is a very, very big deal. Now, the final thing to understand there is that, of course, Yonkin is still governor. So things the legislature does cannot um, trump Yonkin. They can stop him from doing certain things, but they can't force through uh, progress on, on things that, that we'd like to see progress on. The interesting thing is this makes the 2025 gubernatorial race in Virginia a really big deal because you now have in Virginia a state legislature that's quite progressive and could potentially get more progressive. Give them a Democratic governor who's on the right side of the issues, and you could take a state, Virginia, that has historically been a right-to-work anti-labor state and actually start to change some of the laws there in some fundamental ways, something that the previous Democratic governors did not do, um, but I, I think is now within the realm of possibility. So that's just a huge, huge progress there. In New Jersey, where you have you know, Governor Murphy, who is a Democratic governor, uh, had a Democratic legislature, but a complex Democratic legislature with some old school Democrats who weren't e always easy to work with, uh, even for a Democratic governor. These election results, um, by and large, give Murphy a much stronger hand going forward. Uh, they, instead of, you know, kind of moving the state backward on the eve of a presidential election, New Jersey's moved to a more progressive place. Uh, very, very good news. And I'll even tell you one bit of good news. I mean, they elected a gay Democrat to the legislature in Mississippi. And that's progress. You know, even if the Mississippi legislature is pretty Republican, um, it, it overwhelmingly Republican. Uh, this is, we, we have seen in individual races across the country, a lot of breakthrough wins. Uh, and again, even in Mississippi. So let's talk for a second about uh, the fact that it is an off uh, off year election did that you know normally one thinks of an off year uh, the, the again the conventional wisdom off year election tends to be older voters the mix of voters is different it tends to benefit if anything the right but was there anything you think about the mix of voters in these particular elections that might have uh gone against that and benefited democrats instead usually so um look this is a much higher turnout election than most off years. Um, it wasn't at a presidential level, but um, they had huge lines at uh, in college towns in Virginia. And that was a critical factor in Democrats taking control of the legislature there in Virginia. Um, you had a, a very healthy turnout in Kentucky. And I think that was obviously very, very beneficial to Andy Beshear's race for governor there. Um, and in Ohio, turnout was sort of through the roof 
Um, it was it was really, really strong. And so that had an impact, obviously, on referendums in Ohio on abortion rights and legalization of marijuana. But it also kind of filtered down into races for mayoralties, for city council seats, for other positions around the state. And and so, yeah, high turnout, much higher turnout uh, was a factor here, not in every place, not in every circumstance, but by and large. And so what's happening, Richard, is that um, we are in a new world as regards elections. In the old days, uh, you and I and people who cover politics, we would say, oh, well, it's an off year election. We know it's going to be much lower turnout, much older, usually more conservative, blah, blah, blah. The usual standard. Abortion in particular yeah. has shifted that. Now we have higher turnout, more young people, and um, and frankly, more energy around a lot of these elections. And you really saw it play out the other day. The other thing, the one other thing as regards turnout, which was very interesting to me, was watching the Mississippi governor's race. Um, one of the things that Brandon Presley, who was the Democratic candidate down there, did was place a huge emphasis on mobilization of black voters. And that's something that, uh, you know, the, the Mississippi Democratic Party for a long time has relied on black voters. Those are their that's their core constituency. There's no question of that. But what they realized was Mississippi tends to have low turnout. Um off your elections. And, and so can they, could they bump the turnout sufficiently to bring a, in this case, a white candidate running on economic populist issues across the line? And uh, they didn't win. They they only got to 47% of the vote. But with all due respect, 47% of the vote in Mississippi is not too bad. <laughs> you know, it's a, Yeah. How long has it been since Mississippi's had a, a, a Democrat? Uh, in not in this office. century. Not yeah. in this century. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been a while. And yeah. in fact, the last time a, a Democrat won for the presidency in Mississippi was 1976 with Jimmy Carter. So yeah. it's, it's been a while. Um, and so all, all I'm saying, though, is that was very, very interesting and exciting was to watch this this clear embrace of black voter mobilization that that you saw in Mississippi. It was a really big deal. And and there was also some significant black voter mobilization in Ohio, Kentucky and Virginia and probably other states as well. I'm not not diminishing others, but you know, I, I was conscious of it and watching it. And, and I think that's a big issue. It's also one final thing I'll say. There's a lot of speculation about the Democratic coalition, right? Oh, right. Parts of it pulling off or is, Trump eating into some of it. And and that should not be dismissed. That's a real issue. And, it, you know, coalitions do shift. They change. But um, the results from Tuesday night suggest that pretty much across the country, the Democratic coalition is holding better than than I than I probably would have predicted. Yeah, I think better than I would have predicted the um and you wrote about Andy Bashir's uh, victory in uh, in in Kentucky, and it seems that well, first of all, I think he was popular because of uh, a democratic policy, which is uh, health care. That was my understanding. The Kentucky Cares, I think the program is called there, is uh, is well received. But uh, right. you, you know, his dad, his dad was governor. And his, oh, dad, his dad was okay. All right. My his bad. dad actually in, it put Kentucky care into play. And his dad, Steve Bashir, was sort of a brilliant old school politician. That's um, right. Of course. Yeah. And, yeah. and what, he, what he did was he took the, you know, he got what was called Obamacare. And all right. he did was rename it Kentucky care. Right. Right. Genius innovation. But it worked. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're right. I'm sorry to make that confusion. But uh, you wrote that uh, that embracing labor uh, was a major factor in his victory, which to me, it's astonished me uh, for decades now uh, that so many Democrats, uh, well, especially Obama, candidly, uh, had a kind of uh, hands off or uh, distancing uh, Bill Clinton, of course, first, but that labor was almost like the the uh you know uncle you you don't like to have show up at thanksgiving or so on uh, instead of being a respected and appreciated member of the family and i think labor picked up on that you know uh 
the idea of the Democrats as the quote unquote professional managerial class and all that. And, uh, you know, it's astonished me for a long time that the, there hasn't been more embrace of labor. And as you say, this bleed off of not only white working class, but to a much lesser extent, uh, you know, black and Latino working people. And it doesn't take much. So when we say much lesser extent, 15, 20 percent can be a, can shift an election. Right. So, uh, so with that shift, um, it seems to me that Bashir uh, might be onto something. But tell us about that. Labor, uh, am I reading you right? Labor played a, a big role in his or embrace of labor in his uh, success? Sure, certainly it did. And, you know, I'm not going to uh, look, you know me, I'm a very pro labor guy. Right. Yeah. So by the nature of it, you know, I have to be a little careful and make sure that I'm not you know, don't fall in the trap of saying, yeah, labor was the only thing. It wasn't. There was a lot going on in Kentucky. Um, Bashir's embrace of abortion rights was significant. Mm -hmm. um, his courage on vetoing an anti-trans bill was significant. Um, so, you know, this is, Bashir's a very interesting guy on a whole bunch of levels. But a part of his strategy from day one was to be all in for labor. And uh, this wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a vague embrace or a nod or a wink the way Democrats often have done in the past, right? Glad to take labor's money, but not necessarily glad to march with labor, not necessarily glad to move labor's legislation. That was the, the unquestionably the Clinton model to a lesser extent, but till, still somewhat the Obama model. This is very different. Andy Bashir in a right to work state, right? A state that, that has laws that are not friendly to labor and that he is not able to undo because he doesn't have a democratic legislature. But in, in such a state, there's still a labor base. Labor is active. It works hard. It's present. Um, Louisville is a historic union town. Um, right. Other towns around the state as well. And Bashir was always clear that he was pro-labor, but he got a chance during the campaign to kind of come through in a big way. Um, and that was when the UAW went on strike, at a time when Democrats were wrestling with the question of, do you join picket lines? There was Bashir right out there on the picket line. He brought him donuts and sandwiches, I think. You know what I mean? He was he was clearly present as a supporter of the UAW. And then he didn't just do it on the picket line. In the debate, the issue came up and he was saying, Kentucky needs a strong UAW, right? I'm proud to be the pro-labor candidate. Um, it was a different language. It was a different, you know, not just verbal, but the body language. He's comfortable with working class people and um, embraced an endorsement from the United Mine Workers, even though that union has really been beaten down a lot, mm -hmm. Kentucky and other states. And so, uh, yes, it was there was no question of where he was coming from on these issues. And it's not very hard to do that. I mean, you know, it, it's something that the Democrats right. should, should do instinctually. Right. It's it's, right. it's so natural. Um, but you saw it there and it played out well. And can I add one other thing, too? Sure. Um, not just in Kentucky, up in Allegheny County. Again, I keep focusing on this Allegheny County election because Allegheny County is bigger than a bunch of states. Right. And up there, Sarah Inamorato, a young woman with a very, very progressive record, made her embrace of labor central to her campaign. She literally said, I want to create a department or create a, a program within the county executive's office to promote union membership, to promote, you know, the cause of labor. And in a very tight race, because this is a big county with a lot of suburban areas, in a, in a tight, tough race, she prevailed. And I think a big part of why she made it through was her strong embrace of labor. It's so interesting to me. And it's interesting to see, for example, how I assume because of public embrace of unions or popularity of unions success of unions uh biden at least shifted from whatever he did to the railroad workers which i wasn't too thrilled with to at least showing up and marching uh on a picket line or showing up at a picket line for the uaw but uh, you know in a minute or two we have left so we have biden now you wrote about taking his primary challenges seriously this uh, and of course this might change the equation you mentioned that it does in certain ways that the biden agenda seems to be doing well with voters but presidential elections are different 
right? They're different because you see so much of the candidates. It's so much about the personality of the candidates, perception of the candidates. And uh, I still worry, you know, when I covered the last Republican debate, you know, my, I did it with a tone of, you know, I can't believe I have to watch these idiots, basically. And when I watched it the other night, you know, I thought, and I'll just be candid, these people uh, a couple of them, Nikki Haley in particular, whatever I think of their politics, they come across as sharp, fast, uh, in command of the facts. And, uh, you know, I don't I don't know if you'd want to update your comments about taking Biden's primary challenges seriously in light of this most recent election. But yep. I have to say, I haven't stopped worrying because of these elections. I think they're they're a hopeful sign for Democrats for sure, but uh, and maybe a hopeful sign for taking back the House. But uh, I still worry about the presidency, uh, especially and I'm I'm in the minority on this, at least in the pundit class, uh, because I'm not 100 percent convinced Trump is going to be the nominee. Uh, I still think with his legal problems, if he's convicted of something between now and then, he may have to step aside. Uh, but whether he is or isn't, uh, I still worry uh, about a Biden-Harris ticket. I just have to be candid. And uh, I'm wondering if your thoughts on that have evolved as a result of this uh, latest uh, election results or or anything else is going on not at all i'm, I'm going to keep with my concerns i i too worry <laughs> oh man and i believe that the news from tuesday was very very good for joe biden it's mm -hmm. great for democrats and and it was and the president can take elements from that and feel encouraged um but this election didn't make him any younger right and, and it didn't uh make him a different person he is still who he is um he is almost certainly going to be the democratic nominee i think that that's he wants to be and if a sitting president wants to be the nominee they usually are right it's, it's pretty much unheard of i'll give you an example in 1968 uh lyndon johnson took himself out of competition for the democratic nomination had he not taken himself out he would have won the nomination right right it, that he, it would have happened um would have been painful and difficult with opposition from McCarthy and Kennedy that year, but he would have won it. And similarly, um, you know, you just go down the, the pattern. Incumbents tend to keep their nomination. So with that said, um, uh, does Biden have vulnerabilities? There's no question he has vulnerabilities uh, and they are challenging. Those poll numbers are, are real and there's something to be concerned about. However, um, one of the mistakes that Democrats make is that they get so obsessed with polls that they don't look at actual election results. Right? Sure. And there's a whole bunch to be learned from these election results for Biden, right? A, abortion is going to be a huge issue in 2024, no matter who Biden runs against, right? Doesn't matter. It's going to be a giant issue and it's a mobilizing issue. Number two, although Biden's not been as good on this, cannabis is a mobilizing issue, a huge issue. And one that, frankly, Biden should be more supportive of. Number three, Democrats who do the right level of attention and energy to rural areas uh, can actually dramatically improve their position in those areas. Uh, Andy Bashir did that in Kentucky. He moved his numbers up uh, in 91 of Kentucky's 110 counties, 120 counties. I apologize. Get those numbers straight here. In 91 of 120 counties, Andy Bashir did better. Almost all of those counties were rural counties. Many of the places where he bumped up were in eastern Kentucky, frankly, in an area that had voted for Trump. And how did he do that? He spent a lot of time in those places. He had an agenda and he had energy and he took it to them. Uh, Biden should learn that lesson, right? He should he should take that in. Um, and a last thing, and this is a really interesting thing, and we didn't talk about it much, but around the country, uh, candidates who are running on climate issues did really, really well mm. um, in a whole bunch of places. And so instead of being afraid of the climate agenda, Biden should probably kind of re-examine it and think of how do I talk about this some more, right? Blah, blah, blah. So put all that in a mix. Keep that there. There are lessons to be taken, but there are still concerns. Um, the biggest concern, before I flip over to the Republican side, the biggest concern is that, that the Democratic coalition is stressed at this point, and I think profoundly stressed, 
young people do not agree, and I'm not going to speak for all young people, obviously, but a, a tremendous number of young people do not agree with this president on Gaza. And right. I just Palestine. There is a fundamental break there. And the polling data is quite shocking. Uh, right. For Biden. Not necessarily for me, because I think I, I talked to a lot of these folks and I, I can see where they're coming from. But uh, for Biden, it's really serious. He also has a real challenge with Arab American voters, yeah. um, Christian or Muslim. And who are critical uh, in in swing states, uh, at Michigan, least in Michigan, 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 Michigan and, and Minnesota. Jerry, yeah, Michigan, and Arizona. Georgia, Arizona, Minnesota. Yes. Right. And so you got a bunch of states where, because they've got boom metro areas, they've had a real um, kind of incoming of, uh, of of a diverse population of all people from all over the world. But there is there's a presence there, and that politically in these very closely tied states, that is a, an issue to to think about. And um, and then finally, there is some significant evidence that even in very strong traditional uh, parts of the Democratic coalition, particularly the Black community, there's a lot of concern about Palestine, and and mm-hmm. the polling data that suggests that you know Biden's got issues he's going to have to have to wrestle with there, and those aren't the only ones. There are other issues, inflation, things like that. So um, Biden should be out campaigning for president right now. Right. He's got a divided Congress. I know there's a lot of governing he likes to do. Biden likes to govern. And I expect that. And I respect that. But boy, he had to be spending a lot more time out there. And I cannot believe that he chose not to file his name in the New Hampshire primary, uh, the first primary. Now, I know they changed the rules and New Hampshire's right. not supposed to go first and everything like that. But I'm sorry, he's president of the United States. He's running for re-election. He ought to be present everywhere. And um, and I think that leaves openings for his primary challengers. And right. there is polling data just from this last week that shows um, that there are areas of vulnerability, again, especially from young voters, if they show up in primaries. So um, keep that all in mind. I still think it's a concern. I, I take it very seriously. I think Biden's going to be the nominee, but he should be running harder for the nomination than he is. Flipping over to the Republican side, um, you know, I like your optimism for the Nikki Haley candidacy. Um, You know, I'm not sure she's going to actually be the nominee. Oh, no, I'm not saying she will be. I'm saying. No, I'm respecting what you're saying. It's not outside the realm of possibility. That's what I'm saying. No, I'm teasing you a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But. but what I will tell you is uh, the evidence is right now that Donald Trump remains dominant. And sure. I've Donald Trump is a candidate for a very, very long time. Uh, and this is what I'll tell you. If somebody gets close to him, he shreds him. He's very, very good at policing the Republican mm-hmm. Party, i.e. whatever candidate is in his way, he focuses his full energy on taking that candidate down. Uh, he did it to Jeb Bush. He did it to Marco Rubio. He did it to, he just run down the list, Scott Walker. And, um, and so I, I, I'm still in the view that Trump's very likely to be the nominee. What is fascinating to me is that, um, uh, Nikki Haley, I think in the debate the other night was, and, and frankly, most of the debates has been electric. She's yeah. very, very talented as a candidate. I disagree with her pretty much everything. But she's a very talented candidate, getting better with each day. You, you see this sometimes in presidential campaigns where somebody grows as a candidate. She's growing and she's growing fast. And if the Republicans, you know, again, I'm not giving them advice here, but if they were smart, um, they would recognize that. Uh, and I'll give you a good example of of the concern, frankly, something that people should be conscious of. In my state of Wisconsin, a poll came out this week and they polled uh Biden against all the other Republicans. Biden beat Trump in Wisconsin, in the swing state of Wisconsin, by a couple points. But remember, this is a close state. So that's that's a very good number for him, right? He beats Trump. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, with Nikki Haley, I think she was ahead by like, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers, but I think it was like six, seven, eight points. And she yeah. was clearly ahead. A couple things. First of all, John, one is uh, just to be clear, I don't think she can beat Trump, but I think if external end up in jail, yeah, if he's convicted, I think someone's going to, you know, he's going to or in some other way has to drop out that she would be the logical choice. So I, I, I give it a 20, 30 percent at most prob- possibility. But if that happens and you have a visibly aged 
Joe Biden against someone that vibrant and frankly that good on a debate stage. I think it's bad news for the Democrats as opposed to putting them up against, uh, you know, uh, Gretchen Whitmer or a, uh, a Newsom or or someone else that might uh, be f Newsom in particular. Is, uh, whatever you think of him has impressed me, impressed me a lot with Sean Hannity as being fast on his feet in certain ways. Uh, very Californian, but fast on his feet. And so those are the two things. And you're absolutely right about about uh, what's going on in Gaza. That may turn out to be his LBJ moment. And I guess I'll just close and I'll give you the last word, but I'll just close by saying, frankly, I thought one of the better scenarios for the Democrats and this may be the dark cloud inside the silver lining for Democrats of, of Tuesday's results is that I was it almost seemed like it, they were building up to like an intervention. Mr. President, yep. you can't do this. And now I think that's not going to happen. And if that's not going to happen, I think Biden's going to run. He's going to get the nomination. That's a very high risk strategy for Democrats. Uh, but it's what I think they'll probably get now. Um, and uh, uh, that's it. That's my conclusion. But I'll give you the last word. You're spot on. That's exactly it. Uh, in fact, it's very funny. I was speaking last night in rural Wisconsin because one of my great passions is rural politics. And so I was out in the rural southwestern Wisconsin uh, with about 100 folks, a little more, in a supper club in a town of about 3,000. Um, uh, and they were all Democrats, so, you know, overwhelmingly Democrats. And we still have rural Democrats in Wisconsin. And yeah. And I said to him at the start of the talk, I said, I'm glad I came to talk to you on Wednesday night, not Monday night. Because if I had come on Monday night, um, all we would have talked about was those polls, right? The New York Times poll. And we would have been, I think it would have been a deep, serious discussion, not an unhealthy discussion about whether Biden should be the nominee, right? On Wednesday night, it was a wholly different discussion, right? right. Democrats were feeling very, you know, kind of, energized and enthused and and i think hopeful now that gets and, and i'll close off with this that gets to the heart of, of what you were just raising there because um they averted an intervention right that possible moment where and you saw you know axel david axelrod a couple other people yeah. stepping up and saying maybe maybe uh biden shouldn't run um that dead that died out real fast right it's it's yep. kind of been averted by the election results but that's not necessarily healthy right um right. because the 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 discussion that opening up of that discussion is that can be beneficial to biden right right if there is a question about whether he should be the nominee and he steps up and fills the void and makes it clear oh well, no he's ready to do it and everybody's very confident in that that's good for him and and I think that one of the dangers for Biden is that he coasts to the nomination without having to to really lift a finger. Um, I don't think that's necessarily good for him, because then sometime in August, he's the Demo early September. He's the Democratic nominee. No turning back. He's the right. candidate. And and without perhaps the depth of discussion, the depth of examination that that would make sense. And so I really share your kind of trepidation here. Um, but with that said, there is simply no question in my mind that off your elections are definitional. They are much more important than, than we, we tend to acknowledge. They don't predict the results of the next election. But what they do is they set the stage. Right. And I think that that's what happened on Tuesday. The stage was set. And frankly, it is now set for a Biden candidacy as the Democratic nominee. Well, I don't know about you, but I think one of the fun things about covering politics is that just when you think you know what's going on, it changes. Um, but, but with that, John Nichols, Washington correspondent for The Nation, thanks for your coverage of all this. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. Total honor to be with you, brother. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.